praise the Lord. We have been in a teaching series talking about the signs of the times. It started out as one message for one Sunday. We are now on the 17th lesson. My darling wife, Pastor Cheryl, who is not here today, was talking to me about, honey, when are you going to write your book? And I said, baby, when do I have time? She says, you're preaching the book. All you got to do is find out what the technology is to have it written down, and you have your book. Amen. Amen. So y'all pray about that. Amen. Because you know, I don't do anything just because folks say it unless the folks' name is yud hey vub hey, the Lord God Almighty. Amen. I love my wife, but I double-check everything that God wants me to do with God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So uh, I don't know what this is in the outside of church mind of God, but Right now, it is a right now word for right now people. Amen, somebody. Amen. Praise God. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Hallelujah. Somebody say thank you to the media team. Thank you. Amen. Because when they uh, operate in such excellence, it allows my hands to be free so that I can walk around with my Bible. Praise God. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. And the word of the Lord reads, As a matter of fact, why don't you read it with me? Verse 18. Ready? Read. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Let's read it one more time. You by yourself. Ready? Read. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm trusting God that that ambient mic is up. You heard the people say, where there is no vision where there is no chazon, where there is no redemptive revelation from God, where there is no warning from God, don't do do this, don't don't go there, don't don't talk to that person, don't have anything to do with that person, where there is no redemptive revelation, come away from that, don't go to that, where there is no corrective measures from God, the people cast off restraint, they perish. They start to regress and go back to what they used to be. Amen. Hallelujah. We are talking about vision. And as we've spoken about here, These feast seasons that are appointed by God are intended to teach us the three major encounters that a person can have with God. Amen. The three major encounters. Now, please forgive me. I came up here trying to look pretty. I don't know why I'm wearing this jacket. Amen. So I'm going to take it off. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Elder. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The three encounters are the feast seasons of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. In Passover, we learn about God's peace. And the first thing we learn is we can have peace with God. We're no longer his enemy. That's a good thing. Amen. But in addition to that, we can have the peace of God that passes all understanding. When we go through life's vicissitudes, we can just, we can just chill because we know God's got us. Amen. The next thing we learn about, and I love this, we learn about from the feast season of Pentecost, we learn about God's power. Now, God's power is to be a witness. But people say his power is for witnessing. No, it's not. It's to be a witness. Witnessing is one part of being a witness. Amen. When we speak and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, we are witnessing. But we can be a witness by how we live our lives. Amen. I remember uh, years ago, years ago, there was a young lady, 15 years old, and she had uh, a disease called lupus. Everyone say lupus. Now, anybody in the medical team, you know that according to the book, Lupus erythematosus is incurable. Amen. Tell that to her. She got healed. Amen. Hallelujah. We prayed. God heard. God healed. I guess he didn't read that book. Amen. Because he did not stop where the book stopped. He went and did what his book said. He said, these signs follow those who believe. Not the pastors, because I wasn't a pastor back then. These signs follow those who believe. In my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen, somebody. Praise God. So we learn about the power of of God through Pentecost. We are now in the Feast of Tabernacles, the feast season of Tabernacles, where we learn about God's rest. And in that feast season, one of the lessons is the Feast of Trumpets, which talks about spiritual warfare, which now takes us to Ephesians chapter 6 in our New Testament. Hallelujah. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 6. We're looking still at verse 14, but we're going to start at verse 10. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 6. To God be all the glory. Hallelujah. 
Finally, my brethren, my Christian brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord. Somebody say, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor. Somebody say, put the whole thing on. And, and pray. Yeah, okay, I'll do that, Lord. Um, you notice I came up here and I had a jacket on. I came up here with a whole ensemble. Now, the reason I took it off was a very, very natural one. I'm hot. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And rather than, you know, sweat like a pig the whole time I'm preaching, I said, let me be more comfortable. But sometimes as Christians, when being a Christian gets hot, we tend to start taking off parts of the armor because we've been made to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Holy Ghost, I love you. 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 Amen. Be careful. Just because it gets hot, that doesn't mean the battle is going to be any easier. So we need to keep the armor on. So Pastor Paul, shouldn't you put your jacket on? Turn to that individual and say, shut up. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, I'm not putting the jacket back on. It was a good illustration because it came from the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, against the methodias, the tricks, the schemes, the methods, the means. The only power that the devil has is trickery. That's it. He's a deceiver. The Bible calls him the deceiver of the brethren. Notice it didn't call him the deceiver of the world. The world doesn't need to be deceived. The world is deceived. They don't need to be deceived. That's why sin agrees with sin. That's why the world looks at the sin that's around us and says, oh, yes, yes, praise the Lord. Yes, you, you, you can be on a girl's team. That's the, way, that's the way you feel. I already told somebody, you know, I didn't say this, so I, I hope my, my baby doesn't get upset. If my girl was out on a team, you know, say she was on a soccer team, and the other team had a, a biological male out there, I'd walk right out there on the field in the middle of the thing, take my daughter by the hand and take her off. Ain't nobody breaking her leg, knocking out her teeth. I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. We have that Y chromosome. Why? Because we're supposed to be men. Amen. Amen. It just is. It's been biology for how many thousands of years, and all of a sudden now, because people have turned their back on God, professing themselves wise, they've become foolish. No, that's not true. That's not what the word says. I was being too nice. Professing themselves wise, they've become fools. And now fools think foolishness is perfectly okay. I'm not a fool. Amen, somebody. And I pray that none of you are either. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So let's say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's the devil and his um, demonic princes. Against powers. Those are demons of lesser rank that are in and amongst us trying to do the devil's bidding. Amen. Um, we also um, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the, this world. Those are individuals in political power who are demon-possessed, demon-oppressed demon influence who are doing things and can with the stroke of a pen or a word or an edict completely change the course of nations. We've seen that happen. Amen. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I wish he was here. He's away at college. One of our young people, I asked, what is the most um, influential thing that's happening in the lives of young people? And he was um, with our, our media group, but he's away at college right now. He said media. He said artists. It's the truth. Those individuals are used by the devil to get in the heads of young people who will not be young people for much longer. And when they're, it's in your head and you grow up that way, you're going to be an old crazy person instead of a young crazy person. Body. So these artists have a whole lot of influence. Amen. I, I kind of step back and I look. They, they'll, they'll, they'll throw names out here. This artist, that artist, this artist, that artist. They said this and everybody flocks to it. Why? Why? You're following somebody who may be headed to hell. Amen. Is that really where you want to go? You better, you better follow God. Amen. If you're going to follow somebody, follow somebody who's following Jesus Christ. Follow somebody who's living a life that's worthy of being followed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wherefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Everyone say the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is one of the armor pieces of a Christian soldier that is necessary for us to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
But it's, it's, it's come to my understanding that many of us in church circles, we've been taught about righteousness. We don't know what righteousness is. We know aspects of it. But I believe that we're going to get a fuller, deeper understanding of righteousness as we continue to hash through this concept of the breastplate of righteousness. Amen? Now, we're getting ready to go back to Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 15 and look at the Old Testament concept of righteousness. Hold it. Pastor Paul, we're New Testament believers. Why are you taking us back to the Old Testament? Some of you may have been raised in one of those New Testament churches where they don't preach from the Old Testament. They don't believe anything in the Old Testament is for today. Amen. I submit to you they are my brothers in Christ and they are sincerely wrong. You might have come from certain churches that said, you know, well, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentile. So we are redeemed from everything from the Old Testament. I submit to you that they misread that scripture. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. I said, we're redeemed from the curse of the law. We're not redeemed from everything that the law commands. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. The word of God in the law says, thou shalt not murder. Are we redeemed from that? Can I go around just, just killing whoever I want to? You didn't accept Jesus Christ. Off with your head. No, that's what crazy people do. Amen. But that, that law still holds today, doesn't it? Come on, talk to me. Common sense. That law still holds, right? So we're not redeemed from that law, are we? Now, where's the confusion? The confusion is people don't know their Bible. Jesus said, who said? Jesus said, Matthew 5. 17, do not think, don't think for one single solitary moment that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. Jesus said this. He said, I'm not come to destroy. I'm come to fulfill. And the next verse says, not one jot nor tittle of the law will pass away until the world passes away. In other words, not one period or not one comma. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Why? Because for us to be righteous, the law has to be fulfilled. God didn't make a mistake when he wrote the law. Man just couldn't keep it. Oh, Lord, we're going there. God didn't make a mistake. The laws were good. The laws were good. We don't have to cut or slice or, or bloodlet anything because Jesus was cut, sliced, and bloodlet already. But the righteous commandments of the law, we're not redeemed from that. Hello? Jesus said, I came to fulfill it. Now, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, Paul. We couldn't do it. The Jews couldn't do it. We can't do it either. We cannot do that. Yeah, in your own power, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, be strong in the Lord. We could not do Old Testament righteousness in the Old Testament because very few of them, not all, very few of them, obtained righteousness in the Old Testament. But before the law, somebody say before the law, Abraham taught us how to get righteousness with God. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Noah was a preacher of righteousness in the Old Testament before the law. Noah and Abraham taught people, if you'll just believe God, you'll get his righteousness. But folk wouldn't listen. They didn't want to do what was right. They didn't want to be right. They wanted to do their own thing. Sin nature took them in their direction. And because of that, God had to give the law to Moses. So they had something physical to look at as a parable to say, this is right and this is wrong. Are you with me? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. But watch this. Now that God has given us righteousness through Jesus Christ, Guess what he expects us to do? The righteousness that was taught in the law. I'll prove it to you. Turn to Isaiah chapter 33, find verse 15. See, this is the kind of stuff makes some folk mad. You back in that Old Testament again. Yeah, back in Isaiah chapter 33. Back in Isaiah chapter 33. Ooh, Jesus, help me. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Now, in chapter 15 of, of, of the 33rd chapter of Isaiah, you have a concentrated, one-place kind of synopsis of what it means to walk in righteousness from the Old Testament perspective. This is the same perspective that Jesus Christ came to fulfill, not destroy. And listen what it says. He that 
walketh righteously. Somebody say, that's a lifestyle of, of living right. All right. Notice I said a lifestyle. Not a Sunday style, a lifestyle. Amen. All right now. And speaketh uprightly. Notice he goes right to the mouth. Amen. You got to talk right. He that despiseth the gain of oppression or extortion. Uh, in other words, you're obtaining favors or, or money by abusing your authority, by abusing your power. I mean, think, think about it. It's in the news. Every time we turn around, it's in the news. Lord, really? Here we go. If he said do it, you know I'm going to do it, right? Amen. Tell me how do government employees who make less than a quarter of a million a year in just a few years of serving amass tens and, mil and twenties of millions of dollars as their net worth? It wasn't from their salary. They know something we don't know. Thank you. It's called insider trading. If we do that, we go to jail. If they do that, they go to nowhere. They just get rich. There's an individual on, on, on the website. He's trying, he's trying to get me into it. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm a preacher of the gospel. He is making crazy money. I'm not going to mention the name because then I'm going to end up on the FBI's, uh, FBI's um, uh, radar if I'm not already. Praise God. He said, when I do the stock market, I don't look at the stock market. I look at the stock market of, and he said, a person who is a government official. Whenever she buys, I buy. Whenever she sells, I sell. And I never lose money. I think that's what we've been warned against doing. Amen? Amen? And now you understand why people will kill people to stay in power. Because once they're out of that setting, they no longer have access to the things that you get there. And the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen to that. That was good. That was good preaching. It was good preaching. Wasn't it, Lord? Wasn't it, Lord? Thank you, Daddy. Glory to God. Amen. Now, he that walketh righteously, speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of um, oppression or extortion, that shaketh his hands from holding bribes. Won't take bribes. I worked with a lady years ago. And she was um, a self-avowed atheist. And I'm a self-avowed, born-again, Holy Ghost-filled Christian. Amen. And she was always like, Paul, come on. For me, just one time, just one time, Paul. Just say, and she would say a curse word, just one time. What's it going to hurt? Just say. I mean, literally, she would tempt me. Just say one curse word. I said, no. I said, if I gave you a million dollars, you wouldn't say it? I said, no. I'm worth a whole lot more than a million dollars. You see, what the world is trying to figure out, uh, Christian, is what's your price? What's your price? What's your price? You see, your price is the place you've already decided where you'll compromise. And you will set up things in and around you that will allow you to be able to move into that price. Wow. People, places, things, choices, where you go, what you're listening to. Because if you're listening to stuff that talks about bumping and grinding, you're now surrounding yourself with people who will allow you to bump and grind because they'll rather, rather bump and grind right next to you or with you. Hello. Thank you. Amen. He says I'm preaching good, so it's all right. Y'all don't have to amen me. Y'all don't amen because you don't understand what amen means. Let me, tell, let me show you, and I'm never going to do this again. Amen means, no, it wasn't that. The Hebrew is deeper than so be it. Amen means, oh, I got it. So be that in my life. Oh, I, you know what we used to say? I got it. But it's deeper than I got it. Yes, oh, yeah, so be that in my life. Gloria Copeland got it. She would tell people, I take it, I take it, I take it. That's what you say when you, that's what you're doing when you're saying amen. A amen, yeah, a God, that's mine, that's mine. I claim it, that's mine, amen. That's what amen means. Oh, now they saying amen, Lord, you see? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> now watch this, watch. He that walketh 
righteously, speaketh uprightly. That's righteousness. He that despiseth the gain of oppression. That's, that's righteousness. He that shaketh his hands from holding bribes. That's walking righteously. And stoppeth his, his ears from hearing of blood from murderous plots. I'm not even going to go there again. That's righteousness. And shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Ro'a ra. They won't endorse that which is evil. They won't support that which is vile. That's righteousness. I said, that's righteousness. That's righteousness. You can't support what is evil. You can't support what is vile and claim to be righteous. You can't. I said, you can't. I said, you can't. I said, you can't. I said, you can't. I was listening to a man of God. I don't have his permission to, to use his name, so I won't. Very well-known bishop. He's very well respected in just about every black church circle there is. And just saying the words black church, you know me, that's a trial and tribulation for me because the fact that my beautiful Jesus' church has been separated based upon skin color is just... Hallelujah. Anyway, this bishop is respected in Baptist circles, Church of God in Christ, Church of God um, uh, in Christ prophecy, all the Pentecostal churches, highly respected man of God. And my wife and I were listening to his teaching just last week, and he made a statement. I almost fell out the chair. He was talking about the plight in the black church, and he made mention of stuff. He said, and it's not just in the black church. It's in the white church, too. But the problem is we're in black circles, so we hear more about what's going on in the churches that we're, we, we, we frequent. And he said, what is happening, and it starts with the pulpit, the church has allowed itself to be infected and infested with things that create the atmosphere of acceptance for the things that they secretly want to do. So church, folk want to shack up. They got preachers now who preach. You know something? According to the Bible, the moment you slept with somebody, you were husband and wife. So just go on with it. You don't need, don't, the Bible doesn't give you a, a ceremony for getting married. Folk will teach, folk will teach me a mess. No, 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 no. Uh -oh. Well, you know something? We need a new gospel. We've talked about this one. This stuff about staying celibate. I, I mean, I, I just need a new, the church needs a new gospel. As if the old one was broken. The old one's not broken. That individual is broken. But people will flock to churches that preach that so that they can feel saved. God have mercy. They feel saved. What are they? I don't know. I don't know yes, I don't know no. I just shake my head. I'm like, no, 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 no. I was watching a church service. And if my wife hadn't made me know about this, I would not have believed this was possible. They had this massive megachurch. And on the stage, the pastor was leading the congregation in secular dancing to a secular song. Don't ask me the name of the song because I don't listen to secular music, so I wouldn't know it anyway. He was bumping and grinding with his wife on stage. And people in the congregation were doing the same thing. God have mercy on their souls. That's not the place for the... Hallelujah. Ro'a ra. We do not endorse or support that which is evil or vile. That is righteousness. Now, here's the crazy thing. Hasn't Jesus Christ been made unto us righteous? I'm sorry, I, miss, I misspoke. Hasn't Jesus Christ been made unto us righteousness? 1 Corinthians 1.30. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Watch this. Watch, watch, watch. Once Jesus was made righteousness for us, we were now enabled by the power of the Holy Ghost because we'd already received Passover, peace with God, so we could now walk in Pentecost, the power of God, to walk in the righteousness that Christ has already purchased for us. So we don't take bribes. We, we, we don't do evil. Not, not if we're Christians. We have the power to walk holy. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. Now, turn, if you will, 
Wow. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm going too fast, Lord. Thank you. Slow me down. The vile expect endorsement of the vile. Wicked people expect wicked people to have their back. Wicked people expect wicked people to agree with them, to go with them, to support them. My question is, why do the vile expect the support of the righteous? And why do they think they can even pull on the righteous people? Because they have seen unrighteousness in our ranks. They have seen unrighteousness in our ranks and where they see unrighteousness or sin, it is an open door for the enemy to attack with his wiles. Amen. Amen. Years ago, one of the ladies of the church straight out complimented something I said as I was preaching because he said, nobody's saying that from the pulpit. And I never forgot that because it was a woman issue. Somebody say a woman issue. If I can't speak to woman issues, then I'm not worthy to stand behind the sacred desk. I mean, I don't have a woman's perspective, but I do have the Holy Ghost. Amen. I have come to find out that in church circles, church circles, you're going to be given opportunities to either choose God or people. Now, when the people are doing what God says, it's easy because you're choosing God. You reject the people who are doing what God says to do, you're rejecting God. But when somebody in the guise of ministerial leadership or in the guise of church fellowship starts doing that which is blatantly against God, you have the responsibility not only not to follow them, but to go straight to leadership. Pastor Paul, um, I'm sorry, but um, there's some stuff going on in, in your deacon board that you need to know about. Not our deacon board. Our deacon board's tight. Thank God, glory to God, praise the Lord. Some deacon boards are out there trying to, trying to coup, take over the church. Amen. You don't understand how crazy that is. The sheep have gotten together. Mah. 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 And now they're going to put out the shepherd who got us set up to take care of them same sheep. You know what that reminds me of? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so, if we're going to be used by God, we have to be willing that so, we're going to lose some friends. Because we're going to expose some mess. Amen? We're not trying to hurt people. We want them to go to heaven. We want them to be redeemed. We want them to live victoriously. Amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I've done meddled. As much as I'm, no, I'm going to meddle some more. Turn to Job chapter 28, verse 28. Job 28 and 28. Hallelujah. But you in the Old Testament, yeah, the same Old Testament that the Lord says he came to fulfill. The same law and prophets. Hallelujah. Job 28 and 28. And the word of the Lord reads, And unto man he said, the he there is God. And unto man God said, Behold, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. How many of you want to be a person of understanding? Depart from evil. Depart from evil. Now, that word understanding is a powerful word. It's the Hebrew word binah. It means discernment. The ability by which we are able to distinguish virtue from vice, truth from lies. It is the power to perceive the contrasting differences between 
opposing views and their relationship to our tendencies and actions. I took that long definition and I shortened it because it was just too long. It is understanding the relationship between cause and effect. When you allow these causes into your life, this is how they will affect you. Amen. That's discernment. And discernment is a spiritual gift. That's why the world can't get it. They can't see that if you do this, it's going to affect you. Can I give you, can I give you, how many of you know I love America? I love to live in America. Wish I was born in America. I am here free in America. We are going here in America. I love America. Love it, love it, love it. Love, it. love America. Praise God. What America is reaping today, seeds that it sowed a long time ago. It is. Amen. When I was with Brother Michael, okay, praise God. We were talking about back in the days in the 70s, in the hood. I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not giving away men's fellowship because what happens in men's fellowship is, is, is confidential to the men. But back in the 70s, I remember back in the 70s that when the gangs were going crazy, there were no police out there trying to keep the gangs in check. They were allowed to run rampant in the hood. And then the next thing that came along was somebody came up with a way to freebase cocaine and make it more addictive, call it crack. And crack was all throughout the hood. Do I have a witness? It was destroying families and neighborhoods. And the government did nothing. But you reap what you sow. So guess what happened? The stuff that was sowed in the hood started springing up in the hills. And rich neighborhoods started having crack problems. And rich kids started having um, 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 crack problems. The difference is when a rich kid has a crack problem, they go to uh, a hospital. When poor folk have a crack problem, they go to jail. But it became such a nationwide issue that all of a sudden now, dealing with drugs is a federal Get that thing, you know, that fentanyl, that this, whatever it is. We got to deal with it because somehow somebody figured out if you let it happen in poor communities or communities of color, it will happen everywhere else. And so reaping and sowing is a, is a divine law. It hasn't changed. And we're reaping today some of the stuff that we've sown. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Now, in Job chapter 28, verse 28. And unto the man God said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is discernment. It's understanding. Hallelujah. It's understanding. Knowing cause and effect. If we allow this to happen, this will be the effect of it. Amen. But that only happens. Watch this now. Watch, watch, watch. That only happens to those who are walking in the fear of the Lord, which is wisdom, and those who are departing from evil. If you don't depart from evil, you won't discern, even if you're born again. If you're walking in evil, evil makes sense to evil. And so you're allowing it to affect your heart. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Well, bless the Lord. Amen. We're going to teach until you say no teach anymore. Go to Psalms 34, verse 14. Psalm 34, and 14. We're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. We're talking about being right before God. We're talking about the Old Testament concept of righteousness and how we're not divorced from it because we have the righteousness of God through Christ. We're expected to walk in it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. What did I say to go to? 3414. Thank you so much. The Word of God says, depart from evil. Whoops. Depart from evil. Depart from evil. You see that word evil? It is the Old Testament Hebrew word ra. It means malignant, bad, unkind, hurtful, wrong, causing calamity. My favorite of those is malignant. Have you ever heard of a malignant tumor? Yeah. What is a malignant tumor? A malignant tumor is something that has the capacity not just to grow, but to grow very, 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 very fast. And as it grows, it has the ability to kill all the healthy tissue that surround it. That's what it's designed to do. 
a malignancy is designed to kill as it takes over, kind of like countries. It kills as it takes over. We're told here to avoid that. Avoid, depart from malignancy. But, contrary wise, do good. Seek peace and pursue it. We can do that, amen? Because we have the power of the Holy Ghost and we have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Go to Psalm 97, verse 10. Psalm 97, verse 10. Hallelujah for the word. Hallelujah. Psalm 97 and verse 10. The word of God reads, Ye that love the Lord. Stop right there. If you love the Lord, say, I love him. I love him. I love him, I love him better every D-A-Y. I love him better every D-A-Y. Close by his S-I-D-E, I will uh, B-I-D-E. I love him better every D-A-Y. Translation, I love him better every day. I love him better every day. Close by his side, I will abide. I love him better every day. I love him better every D-A-Y. I love him better every D-A-Y. Close by his S-I-D-E, I will uh, B-I-D-E. I love him better every D-A-Y. The word of God says, ye that love the Lord. If you love the Lord, give him a shout. Give him a shout. Give him a shout. Hey! Hallelujah. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him with all my heart, my soul, my mind. I love him. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you. Hallelujah. I love him. I love him. He's been too good to me. I love him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ye that love the Lord. Oops, hate evil. Hate evil. But pastor, we're loving people. We're not supposed to hate anybody. It didn't say hate anybody. It said hate evil. Hate malignancy. Same word, bra. Hate that which has the capacity to infect infest, take over, and destroy. Hate it. Hate it. Hate, don't back it. Don't be friends with it. Look here. We've had individuals who come to this church who have, you know, some challenges. Amen? And we love them because we love them. Amen? But we will not celebrate your challenges. Brother, don't come to church dressed in, in pumps and a dress and ask me if I look pretty. Because if you come to me, you want the truth. And I'm going to tell you, you look ridiculous. God gave you a Y chromosome to be a man, and you look good as a man. But the devil is messing with them, so they are victims. So hold up. Who's responsible for getting these people free? Mark chapter 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. Not the apostle and the prophet, not the pastor and the teacher, not the evangelist. Them that believe is believers. In my name, we will cast out devils. We were in Bible study from way back when on Dyer Avenue in the Bronx. And this sister came to Bible study. And here's the craziness. This is, this is how I know doctrine is based upon the word of God, not the word of man. This was a born again Christian. Spirit-filled Christian. And I'm not sure what happened. Maybe some of y'all can remember it better than I can. But we just went into a place where we started binding the devil. And I remember pointing at her because she was screaming. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I command you, foul demon, come out of her now. And I don't know if you guys remember, she dropped to the floor and started squirming across the floor like a snake. Now, I'm the head of the Bible study. I just cast that thing out, so I had to act cool. Because when you're in, in leadership, your knees can shake in your past, but don't let nobody see it. Amen. And that, but you got set free. Amen. And lived a life serving God after that. Praise the Lord. But that's what we're supposed to get them free. What if they don't want to be free? Then it's out of your hands. The watchman... Watches, warns, and if they don't take the warning, their blood is no longer on your hands. Amen. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, y'all are going to say, oh, but I'm out of time. We're talking about walking in righteousness. And so, God willing, next time I come back, we're going to have to hook up. But I want you to get the last point, the point I'm trying to make. Old Testament righteousness required walking a certain way. Old Testament righteousness required talking a certain way, thinking a certain way, living a certain way. And now that Jesus has been made unto us righteousness, somehow incorrect teaching makes us think that because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, there is no expectation of us to live better. We're supposed to live better. Because we've been made righteous, we can do righteous. We can speak well. We can treat people well. We can be amicable and disagree without being disagreeable. Amen? I don't have to cuss you out to, 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 to tell you that I don't agree with you. I can tell you I, I, I don't agree with you and be as sweet as a mother, buttermilk biscuit. I can. Amen? And that would honor God. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. So we have no excuses. How do I know that? We've already fulfilled the first two feast seasons. We're walking in the peace of God. And we've been endued with the power of God. And that power comes to be a witness. So we're supposed to be witnessing for the rest of the world how to enter into God's rest. And you can't do that by being disobedient to the law. May the Lord add a blessing to the teaching of his word. Hallelujah. Praise God. I am always so thrilled with God when he takes the ingredients of my study and, and, and my attempts at exegesis and just says, you know, shh, it's all right. It's all right. Put, put it out. I have, I have a better dish. And just takes the message in a completely different direction. But we give God praise. Amen? Because as for God, his way is, say it with me, perfect, perfect, perfect. So the perfect word for today went forth. Praise the Lord. And we give God thanks. Now, you're, you're out there listening to this word. And I, I don't know. Is there anybody out there who got something from this message? I mean, we can live better, but we can't do it in our own power. The great apostle Paul, in the book of Acts, talks about the fact that he wants to live a good life, but he had such a challenge doing it. And he says only through the power that he has through Jesus Christ being in his life can he live the way he's supposed to live. I'm a witness. I'm a witness. God has to have a way of getting into your head and changing your thoughts by renewing your mind. But I want to let you know, once your mind has been renewed in an area, you think completely differently about that area, and victory in that area becomes a possibility. It really does. But the first step is to know God and know his peace. And then the next step is to know his power, and then we enter into his rest. You're still at first step. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't know God's peace. You haven't entered it. According to the Bible, you're an enemy of God in your thoughts and in your actions. And you're going to say, and rightfully so, I never did anything to God. I didn't, I, I didn't declare war against him. Well, you may not have gone up to God and said, I declare war. But in your actions and your thoughts, you do. You don't go his ways. You don't seek his ways. You don't worship him his ways. So you have not found God's peace. But here's the cool thing. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. You can't come to the Father unless you come through Jesus. So once you come through Jesus, you find God's ways. You find how to be who he intended you to be. And the more and more you grow in Christ, the more and more you become like Christ and please Father God. Now, this next statement may be a tad harsh, but it's the truth. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. If you die in your sins, you have no hope of heaven. None whatsoever. How? What, what, how, how can I say that? Jesus Christ. You know Jesus wouldn't lie, right? He said, I am the one way. The singular truth. 
the only life. No one comes to the Father unless they come through Jesus Christ. What about all those other religions in the world? Would you like the politically correct answer or the truth? They are all spawns of Lucifer, the devil himself, in an attempt to keep you from being what you ought to be, a child of God through his son, Jesus Christ the Savior. You can receive Christ as your Savior today, right here, right now. What are the prerequisites? Jesus took care of the prerequisites when he hung on the cross and said, it is finished. You need to receive what Christ has done. When Jesus suffered, bled, and died, God took all of your sin and put it on him. And he took that sin with him when he died and went to hell. Deposited it there when he rose from the dead. Wouldn't you like, rather than to deal with your own sin, have Jesus have already dealt with it? He took the weight of your sin. If you reject Jesus, what you're saying is, never mind, I don't, I don't want G what Jesus did for the world. I will handle sin on my own. Well, the wages or the payment for sin is death. And the death is not talking about physical death. It's talking about eternal death and hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I don't know, it sounds like a common sense thing to me. Hell? No hell. Heaven? No heaven. Maybe somebody just never broke it down to you. God loves you. And he has a wonderful plan for your life. But that plan starts with you accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord. How do you do that, Paul? I mean, I think, I think, I think, I think I'm ready. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to ask you to simply say it after me. But don't just talk the talk. Speak it from your heart. Speak it like you really mean it. And based upon Romans 10, 9 and 10, which says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I've been doing this a while. God has shown me how. It would be my honor and my privilege if you would allow me the joy of leading you to know my Jesus today. The church is going to say it along with you. You're going to hear those voices supporting you. And sometimes those voices here supporting you are also repeating Jesus Christ. But we're going to say this together. Repeat after me. Dear God in heaven, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. And I need a Savior. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is my Lord. I believe in my heart, God has raised him from the dead. According to the word of God, right now, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I am a child of God. Heaven awaits me. Hell is in my rearview mirror. Thank you, God, for saving me today. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer, and you meant it, welcome. Welcome, beloved, to the family of God. You're a child of God. You're my brother or sister in Christ right now. And here's the great thing. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or rich or poor. It doesn't even matter what language you speak. We're one in Christ Jesus. You and I are one in Christ Jesus. Welcome. Welcome to all that God has for you. That wonderful life starts today. We would love to be able to help you stay on this road with God. If you don't have a church home where you are and you're not anywhere close to us, to help you find one. But if you are in the tri-state area, please come on down to fellowship with us. This is one of the most beautiful churches 
and the most beautiful people on the planet, and they will take real good care of you and make you feel the home. Amen? Now, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice here in the sanctuary who received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord today, I ask that you raise your hand. We, we want to extend that same invitation to you. Praise God. I don't see any hands, so I have to believe that we are all believers. Amen?